I'm going to call this meeting to order. My name is Dakota Brown. I use she, her, they pronouns, and I identify as disabled. I have a mental illness, and I also have a hearing disability. And I just want to welcome you all here. We're doing what we can to ensure that people with disabilities are getting the mental health support that is trusted and trauma-informed and accessible. Because as we all know, the world isn't necessarily designed for those of us who have bodies and brains that maybe work a little differently. Um, I appreciate your time is valuable. So thank you for helping us kick off the weekend on National Donut Day. I have a Krispy Kreme for a newcomer and Tana is gonna work uh, with me on this. If this is your first, second or third meeting, Please put your name in the chat and your contact information. And this would have to be electronic because this is a electronic certificate for $20 Krispy Kreme. And Tana's going to draw one of those names at random. So you'll have for the next probably uh, two minutes to get your name and your contact info in the chat. And then we'll have a winner <laughs> at the end. Pete, I just saw your, <laughs> your emoji. It's like, <laughs> I love that. I did enable captions, so you can find those at the bottom. It should say show captions, or you may have to click those three dots to get that uh, prompt. And we want to know more about you. So I have a demographic form I would love for you to fill out. The county wants to base its best practices on actual data that we have. So uh, we'd like to know like what part of the county needs the most funding, um, where our uh, populations, our communities are throughout the county. I'll give you a second. Uh, if you need to get your phone out to get the QR code, you can uh, get that way on the chat. And while we're doing that, I'm going to socialize a little because I see so many great people coming in. I saw Jennifer, Ceci's here. Awesome. And Estefania, wonderful to see you. Elizabeth. Oh, you're at Lake Elsinore. And America. America is very faithful. She comes to our meetings a lot. I hope that you've won um, a certificate. America, because you, you've been here enough. <laughs> okay, we're going to go move to the land acknowledgement. And I would like to get a volunteer. Somebody Is somebody brave enough to read the land acknowledgement today? Oh, thank you, Leah. I'll do it. That would be great. No telling what it's going to sound like, but I will try. <laughs> Riverside University Health System Behavioral Health acknowledges the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary homelands of the indigenous peoples of Southern California, whose land it occupies. The Cuia, Cupeño, Luceño, Serrano, Chimueve peoples mm -hmm. and their ancestors have been here since time immemorial, caring for the land with great integrity. The first peoples honored the earth, animal, and plant beings, the water, and all peoples that lived here. We acknowledge this reciprocal relationship and intend to continue and extend the values of caring and emotional wellness to all indigenous peoples. Native Americans and residents of Riverside County, RUHSBH, creates relationships built on trust and accountability with its community members. With this land acknowledgement, Riverside University Health System Behavioral Health commits to be respectful to and mindful of tribal sovereignty, culture, and beliefs of the indigenous peoples of this land. So what I love about having um, people who are unfamiliar with it read it is that it puts us into that a little bit of that awkward space that we all need to learn to experience a little more. It's okay to be a bit uncomfortable and it's okay. We extend grace to others and we extend it to ourselves also. So to put some teeth into this land acknowledgement, I want to play you a three minute video. Um, performative allyship is when, you know, we say, oh yeah, we're, we're inclusive, but I like to make sure that we're doing something to elevate uh, the Native American community. Hello everyone, I'm Jeff Gruby, Chairman of the Awo Kante Band of Kui Indians, and I'm here to share our migration story with you. <laughs> the 
These bird songs we sing today go back since the beginning. They're social songs and they're often sung during celebration. They're called bird songs because they talk about our people's migration. The migration story begins at the end of our creation story. When our God, Mukot, passed away, there was a time of sadness and mourning. Our people were lost and didn't know what to do without our God. So we left our home and started on this long journey. We circled around this continent searching for ourselves and our home. And along the line, of course, you know, people get tired, you know, they get discouraged and they stopped and they stopped following the migration. They were hungry or they were cold or they were hot or they were just, you know, this is a place where I want to have my family. And these bird songs that we sing tell the story of our journey. They talk about the different animals that they encountered, their experiences, the terrain. They talked about walking through the rain, through the cold and the wind. Every aspect of that journey was told in these songs. And we have so many songs that you can sing for several days straight and not sing the same song twice. He says the butterfly migration, but they call them bird songs. And um, but it was about our people. Our people did the same thing. We hit, were here, and we kept going down, trying to find a better place. They always were trying, saying maybe there's a better place than here. And that's what they did. They traveled down, and they went into Mexico. You know, went in, down to the bottom, I guess, of, of South America. And during this journey that took a long time, we realized that our home was where it all started, here in the Coachella Valley. And that's what it is. It's just a, a story of our people trying to find uh, somewhere a better, but found out that there was no place better than where they were from. And so our people ended up back here in the Coachella Valley, and we've lived here ever since. What that puts me in the mind of is there's no place like home, right? You click your heels three times and there's nothing better than home. Community agreement. So safety is very important to us, emotional safety. I want you to feel free to um, be honest and share and to feel emotionally safe uh, that you won't be criticized. So we take space, make space. We don't judge. Take care of your needs. If you need to step away, please do. We respect diverse opinions and beliefs. If there is a Zumba, I mean, we're going to close the meeting. We'll communicate via email on how we will proceed. If it's still early in the meeting, we can re-meet. But if not, we may just um, end the meeting. In accordance with our decision to be as accessible as possible, we are going to post a recording of this meeting on various RUHSBH websites. And by attending, you're consenting to... Uh, authorize us to post this meeting video online. Okay, so now our icebreaker. <laughs> National Donut Day. Your icebreaker question is just to share your favorite kind of donut or pastry. You can either put it into the chat or you can come off mic and share. I'll be watching the chat and I'll just jump in and tell you mine is Eclair. Eclair's got everything you would ever need, right? Um chocolate and filling. Ceci says maple bars. I never got that, but um, I know some people love them. Pete, chocolate, vanilla, cream. And Rachel, what's yours? Glaze. Plain glaze. Keep it simple. Yeah. <laughs> You've got a lot of company in the chat. Chocolate with sprinkles. Oh, Marina, I'm just cocoa for anything with coconut. I'll take it. Cinnamon. Oh, you guys. This is great. I don't know what a Florentine is. Elizabeth, Florentine. I think I've seen it at a bakery. Sorry, I I, I, I was just saying that it's all donuts. <laughs> but that was from a, it's from a French bakery. No, no, no. It can be a, a pastry or a donut. Don't worry. Oh, okay. Okay, gotcha. I'm sorry. You have to leave the meeting. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, they they kind of look like um, those Italian. It's like a little roll with the cream inside. They can is it cannoli? Yes. Cannolis. It looks like a cannoli, <laughs> but it's made with almond uh, almond flour, and it's super super yummy. I'm just getting the munchies just looking at our 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 chat. Um, yeah, <laughs> Clara, I'm with you on that. So, 
minutes approval. This is for May 5th, we met. Uh, this is the attendance, if you were here and you see your name on there, let me know if there are any corrections. If you weren't here and your name is showing, let us know. Or if you were here and it's not showing, let me know. Uh, I did talk to Lisa Moran and she's given the approval for these minutes, but we are going to approve these once we move through them. Okay, so if we on that, let me uh, go ahead and bring up the minutes themselves. And... I do have a question on 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 them. Uh, and I wasn't here. I just have a question. Um, it says on the minutes, um, uh, April minutes were shown and approved by Tana and Misty, but I don't see Tana as a member present. Oh, let me look at that. Okay, that's a thank you. That is a good. You're right. So we're just, thank you. We're going to make that just... correction. We'll have to look at the video recording and see who I know Misty did the uh, move to approve the minutes. And who was that, by the way? Thank you so much for being on top Clara. of Clara. Oh, Clara, Clara. awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi. You are detail oriented. Okay. I think we're going to be looking at the minutes now. Yep. And I'll just scroll through here. Actually. If you remember, we had uh, Guide Dogs of the Desert shared. And they are still looking for puppy raisers, by the way. Puppy raisers are very unselfish because they spend those first couple years and then they say goodbye. They're like foster parents. Let me know if I'm going too fast. We had a lot of updates. Of course, we'll do the roundtable again today at the end to... So you can announce your events and such. All right. Uh, that being shown, can uh, can we get somebody to move that we approve the minutes uh, with that correction? Tana here, I do. Thank you, Tana. Can we get a second? I'll second. And who is that? Peter. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> okay. I like it. So earlier I was mentioning about awareness into acceptance, into pride and um, autism did that. It used to be autism awareness. Now it's autism acceptance. June 18th is autism pride day and it recognizes the role of neurodivergence in bringing about positive changes in the larger society. So to share her personal story with uh, autism, here is Tana Butler, our co-chair. Thank you, Dakota. Hi, my name is Tana Butler. I am autistic. I was diagnosed as being on the spectrum 14 years ago when I was 32 years old. I had been trying to live a life without the benefits of knowing why I was the way I was. In fact, I was labeled mentally retarded. And my mental and emotional development was that of a five-year-old. I grew up in a non-supportive family, often compared to my twin sister. My mother frequently told me to act normal. Or well, why can't you be more like your sister? I felt misplaced and grew up with people telling me I would never amount to anything. I felt like I didn't matter. At a time I should have had a mother, I was taking care of my own mother. I had my daughter when I was 16 years old, but I was emotionally and mentally unable to give consent and was taken advantage of. When my daughter was in fourth grade, I volunteered in her class and began to work with other teachers. But the only book I was able to read and comprehend was my daughter's little golden book, The Little pokey puppy. I asked teachers if I could borrow books from their classroom library and had them explain parts of the books that I didn't understand. I developed my reading and math skills so I could help my daughter and other children. When I was diagnosed autistic, I read everything I could about it and learned more from the special education teachers I can totally see myself in the example 
they gave and finally understand that my brain isn't bad or wrong. It just works differently. I had been labeled retarded when I should have been told I was autistic and given support and encouragement. So what is it like being me? My sensory experience is difficult in crowds. The sounds and visual discomfort of seeing so many people can overwhelm me. This has gotten worse since I became deaf. I can um, have meltdowns. I have foot problems which challenge my coordination, but I live a typical and normal life, an independent life. I have a supportive roommate and I drive. I have a wallet card and medical alert bracelet, which shows authorities that I am autistic. I am now verbal and expressing my feelings more. It's okay that I'm unique. The world would be boring if we were all the same. I advocate for people with disabilities, all types. I am an ambassador for MindSpring's Mental Health Alliance. I serve as co-chair for RUHSBH. S and Disability Equity Alliance, where I give feedback and help the chair run meetings. I do outreach to disabled communities because after falling through so many cracks for so long, I am finally being supported. I told my abusive family goodbye and I am building a family of support for myself. I am learning self-love. I understand about recovery and taking care of my needs. I have learned that I matter to myself and to others. It matters that I'm alive and I'm helping myself in a way that lets me help others. The diagnosis of autism is just a label. I am proud to be autistic and proud of my accomplishments. I am one out of 5.4 million US adults that have been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Thank you for hearing my story. Oh, thank you so much, Tana. That was generous of you to share your story. So appreciate it. Are there any questions for Tana? Well, that was brave. I want to uh, mention that I, I learned this week about the free rides this summer. Uh, RTA, yeah, Riverside Transit Agency, um, through August 31st, and this started earlier this week, it's 25 cent rides on all fixed routes. And that includes weekends. Now, additionally, Fridays through the end of this month are free. And also for July, starting July 1st, youth under 18 can ride RTA buses for free all summer long. And I guess if you want to tell, oh, do I have the website here? I do. Let me, uh, I'm going to put the website link into the chat if you would like to get those numbers again on, you know, which, which, which deals are going which days. But with our large uh, geographical area, it's so nice to see public transportation become affordable. And, you know, Riverside Transit Authority Agency covers pretty much Western and Mid-County, everything but the desert. Uh, Norco, Corona, Murrieta, Mead Valley, Temecula, Hemet, Beaumont. Yeah, okay, so I wanna leave. Now, before we go to Agency Spotlight, let me mention, Tana, I hope you're looking at the chat. You've got a lot of nice feedback from people. And like Fanya saying, thank you for letting us get to know you. Um, that's a little piece of intimacy yeah. that we got to have today. Awesome. Uh, let me jump to this. Disability Rights California popped up on my radar uh, last year when they, well, a couple of years ago, but last year they started educating us about the shortcomings of SB 326, which turned into Proposition 1, which is the BHSA, which eventually passed. Uh, Rosie Tellis has worked with DRC for 11 years. And in addition to getting multiple awards for her dedication and commitment, she's now the supervising coordinator for the statewide peer self-advocacy program with DRC. 
And Aurelia uh, Sanchez is a peer self-advocacy coordinator with DRC. She's someone with lived experience with a mental health condition and also peer partner, peer parent partner experience. So here to talk about Disability Rights California, please welcome Rosie Tellez and Aurelia Sanchez. Thank you. Thank you, Dakota. Um, hello, everyone. I wanted to introduce the Disability Rights California Peer Self-Advocacy Program. In the spirit of Nothing About Us Without Us, which is the marching anthem of the peer movement, we will share with you some information about who we are, what we do, and how to access resources on our website. Allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Aurelia Sanchez. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a peer self-advocacy coordinator with DRC. I've been with DRC for the past two months now, and I really enjoy my job. I have been employed in the peer field since 2016 and received my peer certificate in 2023. And I wanted to also introduce my colleague, uh, Rosie Tellez. Hello, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dakota, for connecting us and having this opportunity for us to share more about our peer self-advocacy program. So thank you, Aurelia. I've been with the agency, as Dakota mentioned, for quite some years now at different capacities, and I have the privilege to now be the supervising coordinator, which just comes with a little more responsibility, but nevertheless, up here myself and having navigated the various journeys that um, similar to some of us might have uh, experienced. So very, very uh, excited to be here with you all today. I just wanted to share about uh, our program. The Peer Self-Advocacy Program has been in existence since 35 years now. We've been funded through uh, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, and actually goes into the funding that we call PIME. So it's the Protection and Advocacy for Individuals with Mental Illness. Um, I'd like for you to know that we are the only peer self-advocacy program funded under this through the whole nation. So there's other protection and advocacy in each state. So it'd be like, say, disability rights, say, New York or disability rights, Michigan, and so on and so forth. Each state, we happen to be disability rights, California, but we're the only ones with this funding, PIME funding, to have a peer program. So we hope that there would be opportunities to expand that further. But happy to know that um, we've been longstanding reaching out to our peers and providing the services that we do and doing something different than what the rest of our agency does. So DRC mm -hmm. is a nonprofit law firm, right? So these are attorneys and, you know, they go out and represent individuals with all types of disabilities. We have various units. The one that Aurelia and I work for, it's the educational one, and it's based on peers with lived experience in our unit, everyone from the director on, on down, we all identify with having a mental health disability. So the work that we've done has been in various locked facilities and in settings, having to find ways to educate providers and also those that support um, our fellow peers. So as we know, peer-to-peer -peer support is quite evident, right? We know that this is an evidence-based practice and it's been longstanding for, for many years now. Um, we understand that also this level of experience that a lot of folks talk about recovery. Um, for a lot of us, it might be a process of discovery. Tana mentioned, you know, um, her lived experience. And I can tell you, I've been navigating mental health services since the age of 10 behind the divorce of mom and dad at the early age. And so I've navigated mental health services even prior to that. So I can tell you, I wouldn't know anything different. What am I supposed to recover from? To me and uh, uh, in my adult life, I had to find ways to discover and build skills and learn techniques and kind of develop those tools that will help me cope and, and be well and be able to do the work that I do. So without further ado, I'll have um, Aurelia share a little more about our TSA program. Thank you, Rosie. So who do we serve? With our PIME funding, we, pri we primarily serve people with severe mental illness, like Rosie had said, who live in locked facilities, um, psychiatric facilities throughout the state. These include care facilities where people are on involuntary three-day or 14-day holds, state hospitals where people are on penal code commitments or LPC, LPS conservatorships, and longer-term facilities. 
We also provide services to other underserved communities such as ethnic and language distinct communities and people living in rural areas, people who are unhoused and the LBTQ, LGBTQ community. We also can work with and train facility staff and other service providers who work with people with mental health disabilities, such as law enforcement and the legal system. And our PSA program's purpose, mission, and goals are by teaching participants their rights and the self-advocacy knowledge and skills necessary to advocate for themselves. We help them identify their needs and efficiently uh, resolve their issues to access services and reach their goals. Our groups are not support groups or therapy groups, rather they're educational and focus on rights-based rights information they can use to advocate for themselves. Um, our services are mainly to provide um, in a group setting, which provides individuals who need peer support and a chance to share experiences and help one another find solutions. I also wanted to share here in the Valley, um, I'm the only one that uh, is out in this area. So I take a lot of pride in that. Um, I just started groups at uh, Desert Sage in Indio as well as the Indio Puff Unit. So I just started there and I'm trying to establish a group in Riverside and all the way up to San Diego. So I'm very excited. Um, and I wanted to just share a little interesting fact about myself. I used to work with Riverside County. I was there for three years. I worked with the whole program as well as the SMART program. So I, I used, um, you know, the people that I've known, my old colleagues to kind of like network back in. And I just went to a peer group. Um, it was yesterday and I got to, you know, see familiar faces. Um, it was very exciting for me. And I'm gonna, I'm supposed to meet um, with the Tate program and also present to them as well to kind of, you know, to educate um, the community about what, what DRC is all about. So I'm, I'm super stoked about it. I'm excited. Um, most definitely. Um, but like I said, we, we provide individuals who need peer support and a chance to share experiences and help another, you know, one another find solutions to get what they want and need. And because the focus of our work is to educate people to advocate for themselves, we do not advocate directly for people, but we do assist them to become independent and to develop the tools and skills to advocate for themselves and to become self-sufficient. Thank you, Aurelia. And I think that's the purpose, right, of peer-to-peer -peer supports and us like being of uh, support to each other and the works that we do. Now we're collaborators and we're colleagues and we're community partners, right? So it's the beauty of also developing those great uh, relationships with one another and uplifting each other. So I think from the whole group, I've had an opportunity to meet Tanya at a workshop some months ago and Tanya has linked us with uh, Misty in Dakota. So it's great to be able to be a service to you all and introduce what our program does. So in addition to what Aurelia mentioned, I wanted to share that too, we have developed a wonderful working relationship with other peer community organizations um, to do more of the train the trainer model, right? And have you all learn from the skills and the resources that our peer self advocacy program has. So then therefore you can go on and share with uh, the people you serve. And um, we're excited to also expand our services to youth, our transitional age youth from the ages of 16 to 24, and really teach on the various complex topics of understanding how to navigate, you know, conservatorship. It's a lot of people are on conservatorship, don't even know how they landed there. So really important to understand their psychiatric holds and timelines. Others help folks understand how they can uh, benefit from uh, disability benefits. Um, what is the eligibility criteria, how to process the applications, and that folks have the right to appeal a denial. Oftentimes people give up and feel hopeless and, you know, not carry on with uh, pursuing, um, applying for benefits. And so we, we do those trainings as well, understanding what are some of the basics to, um, to reach out to some of those federal programs, some of the state programs that people can, can apply for and, and benefit from. Um, we do other topics. I know Dakota has shared the various interests that your area has to learn from us. And we would like to schedule those meetings for other times where we can really break down the topics, provide you the objectives and what you're interested in learning from us. And as Aurelia said, we're really happy that we're able to connect with you all and putting ourselves out there to be of service. 
Um, and as uh, Aurelia mentioned, the various settings that we work on, we do a lot of our work virtual, in person, whether it's trainings, workshops, um, professional development for staff. Uh, we've done that in the past as well. Um, let's see. And I think we can go on a little bit into some of the training materials and what we pride ourselves in, Aurelia. Okay, so let's talk about the DRC's training materials. We have a library of training materials that we develop. It's uh, new materials that we need. We customize our trainings to meet group members' different learning styles, and we really take pride in ourselves in educating our peers in plain English. So uh, people first language, customized for groups, translations, worksheets, role plays, hypo um, hypothetical scenarios, games to meet different learning styles and importance of supporting staff. And there actually is a law that requires agencies to comply with and explain legal terms to the public in plain, Eng plain English. So we get a better understanding of that. Um, also, when we uh, when we do like PowerPoints, any materials that we come up with, we do uh, do like a word check to make sure that it is at the plain lang language level for, for them to understand. Um, as for our PSA state hospitals, patients' rights, non-deniable subjects to denial for good cause, services is at LPS units, Metro versus non-LPS units, Metro Napa, unique issues related to confinement, educate regulation amendments, changes, and anything that impacts their day-to-day. -day. Um, collaboration with DRC attorneys, so we have a Ask a Lawyer Day. Customized materials, handouts, info sheets, and regulation codes and laws pertaining to their commitment. PSA has successfully um, outreached and facilitated trainings at non LPS residents at Napa State Hospital on forensic commitments. PSA continues to serve uh, Spanish speaking communities at Metro State Hospital for English speakers, one for LPS residents and one for residents on penal code commitments. Our program received a request to bring uh, PSA services to residents at Patton State Hospital started, which started in August of 2023. Provide service, services at, uh, I don't know how to pronounce the state, uh, at tes, uh, Tescadero, I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> state Hospital via Patient Education Network and that started on August of 2023. In addition to providing rights-based information to self-advocacy groups and through trainings, the PSA program has taken a lead role in our California Memorial Project or CMP. And Rosie can explain in detail about that as well. Thank you for mm -hmm. all those details. So in essence, we have five state hospitals throughout the state. And you know, when our fellow peers, uh, you know, not only have the diagnosis, but they've committed a crime, oftentimes part of their um, uh, what is a commitment would be to go to a state hospital and that's just to cover the piece of their mental health treatments. And so they'll end up at locations like Atascadero, Metropolitan, Patton, that's the one that's closest to you. And in essence, and some of them were able to access in person and, and Atascadero, that was something that has not yet uh, flourished, it hasn't come to be, but they've asked us to provide recorded trainings and that they will uh, provide them the opportunity to be educated via their patient education network. So it's kind of like our PBS channel, right? So they'll put like a particular topic and it just runs as that topic for 30 minutes. They'll just be playing and it'll be played periodically. And so I think I'm really excited that we had an opportunity to do that level of access to our peers, um, despite of us not being able to be there in person. So thank you for sharing that, Aurelia. And now regarding our California Memorial Project. So I just wanted to inform you that this has been going on since 2002. Uh, thanks to the support of the then Senator Wesley Chesbro, he sponsored a bill to promote um, this California mm -hmm. Memorial Project. There's uh, three goals of this project. Was, was One was to collect oral histories of people who have lived at state hospitals. The other was to restore the cemeteries and also uh, put on some monuments and research the names of those who were deceased. So in the past, they were not being honored by name. There was a lot of stigma attached to it and a lot of shame by family. So people were not recognized by name. They were recognized by a number, right? So that's no longer the case. Just last year, we had an opportunity to unveil um, seven standing pillars are just about five feet high, they're concrete pillars 
And they have the names of over 8,000 of our peers that were residents there at Napa. And so that was one of the uh, latest highlights from the California Memorial Project. And this was, again, I mentioned since 2002. And um, later on in years, the California uh, State Assembly honored the third Monday in September to be the California Memorial Project Remembrance Day. So I'd like to invite you all to join us on the third Monday in September to be part of the statewide uh, event where we all honor peers who lived and died in state hospitals and hold a five minute moment of silence. So that will take place at 1 p.m. We have a virtual presentation, a virtual um, ceremony that will take place. And in person, uh, we were able to coordinate something uh, to be there at the James Hall Auditorium in Norwalk at the Metropolitan State Hospital. At Patton, the peers will have a ceremony within their grounds, but we weren't able to coordinate outside public to come in and be part of that experience. So for this year, we hope that things will change for the following year. So I've shared with you about those annual remembrance ceremony. And in fact, I could share more about that via uh, sharing the webpage on our chat regarding the CMP, the California Memorial Project. <clears throat> and I can place it on our chat here to everyone. This will give you just a link to learn more about CMP. And um, also I wanna invite you all, if there's anyone you know, or um, asked peers if they would like to honor someone who might have lived in that at a state hospital and they want to include their name to an honoring canvas tree that we have. We attach loved ones names on there to honor those loved ones who might have passed. So um, I thought I'd share that with you. It's a great way to honor them and, and this uh, honoring tree that the peer self-advocacy program has. And I also wanted to share an opportunity where you can all join our um, you know, access our website. I'll go ahead and paste it on our uh, chat here and have you know that you don't have to wait on us. So enter, you don't have to wait on us to be able to provide you information. I wanted to do a demonstration if it's, a, if it's okay to share my screen and provide you just a brief demonstration of how you can access a lot of these resources that are available to you from our agency. So. I'll be, sharing. be able to. Okay, enter, so screen two. Okay, so this, when you go into our webpage, this is what would be your landing page, right? The Disability Rights California. I want you to know that under resources, you have self-advocacy resources and they're all separated in these tiles by name. So sorry for the scroll here. I'm gonna go ahead and scroll down to mental health and give you the ability to have you directly access what Dakota was sharing, right? That the information related to SB 43 and Care Court, there's some community frequently asked questions. And remember that Aurelia shared that we pride ourselves in sharing information in plain language. So you will just click here and it will give you information. Not only that, as you join our website, it's available in other languages. So this very information would be available to people with different distinct language needs, and it would just break it down for people. What is this? And it will break it down for you, the other as well as SB 43. Sorry for the scroll here. I'm going to come into the community, uh, community frequently asked questions. Um, it will go on and explain to you this was a Senate bill from what year, what it entailed. And who does it include, right? What is the difference? What was the grave disability before? And what is it considered now, right? And um, it walks you through the different holds. We understand that a lot of people had a lot of questions as to who does it involve? What does all these terms mean? It really breaks it down for you all. And I thought I'd share that with you here. So you know you have these tools available to you at the tip of your fingertips or whatever the term is. Also, wanted to invite you all to our event that we're having. We have ongoing webinars. Um, you can come into upcoming webinar. Our coworker, Debbie, will be presenting these uh, next Tuesday, June 11th. 
And um, it'll be the topic related to the one, two, threes and ABCs of how to access Department of Rehabilitation, how you can best understand, you know, how you can access that benefit. So we do have ASL interpreters as well. And so you can just register here. It tells you a little bit about what we will cover and a little bit about the speaker. And stay tuned. We have ongoing webinars. Also, if there's something that, you know, was really important to you, you might have missed. Under the events page, we have something that might have been previously recorded webinars. And again, they're all broken down by topic. So depending on what's of interest, you know, feel free to tap into that. Um, might have been benefits, it might have been uh, self-advocacy tools, anything related to social security. There you have it. So I thought I'd share that with you all. Um, and you have our link. So I'm open to any questions you may have. And uh, Aurelia, I think you, uh, we're going to share with them a couple of questions we would like to hear from our uh, attendees. Thank you, Rosie. Um, now that we have given you a lot of information about our program and services, we want to hear from you. Um, what has peers taught you that helped to identify your goals and advocate for them? Does anyone want to share with us? I also have two more questions. You could pick from one. <laughs> uh, what is the self-advocacy skill that is most uh, adventurous to you? And what have others learned from you to self-advocate? I would say mental health because you guys know that I volunteer for Rialto Clubhouse and it's peer-to-peer -peer support and we deal with a lot of mental health. We deal with meltdowns. We we deal with a lot of different um, things that go on there. So I think coping skills, they've got, they taught us coping skills and I've taught them coping skills. So mental health is is the most thing that I focus on. Yeah. yeah, and I'm supposed to start actually do uh to do groups uh at the clubhouse in Rialto because I know I was I was had been there with Rosie, so I'm really excited about doing starting that as well. Let me know when you do because that's the one I attend. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Does anyone want to share anything, even if it's not to answer a question? Any any comments that you want to say or anything that you found that um you know that was interesting for you? Well, Peter already signed up for the upcoming webinar. Oh, all right. So you've got like a whole library of resources there, don't you? Yes. So. I'd like to to share my my experience. Uh, I'm I'm a mother of two children on the spectrum. So um, I think what I've learned from self advocates in the past has been. Um, to me, kind of where they're at and how come a behavior is the way, you know, it is. It's not a personal thing, right? And it's like, uh, it's not a challenge or it's it's they're coping with what they're coping with. And, and it really helped me understand, you know, sometimes um, it's they, they are where they are and they're going to figure out like their own, all I can do is give them the skills and if they apply them, then then that's okay. And if they don't apply them, that's okay too. But it's it's just being able to provide the information. And I think I've I've learned a lot as as far as um, uh, ableism goes. Right? Uh, there's a lot of there's uh, and and I mean it's just a continuous learning opportunity from from and 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 I've got some little self advocates. You know, my kids are are their number one, like, and sometimes they advocate with me, right? And I'm like, ah, you know, that's not supposed to work like that. But, but that's mm -hmm. the goal, right? That they want, they need to self advocate and talk about what are their needs? You know, do I need to, um, you know, give them space before they talk or, you know, or, or not bring them to loud restaurants or not, you know, ensure that, that I'm setting them, them up for success. Um, or I back up when I have to. And, and, and that's just kind of like a personal experience, but in the larger scope of it, um, we also provide that for parents because we do a lot of parent training and, um, and education. So a lot of parents come uh, 
And one of the things is that people don't like to be talked about, you know, mm-hmm. like the kids and parents will come up to me and say, you know, she has autism and she's doing all these things. And, um, and sometimes I say, Hey, you know, like I, like I point to the ears, like they can hear or, Hey, let's step away from So then that way the child doesn't hear the, the, uh, and, and I'm sure they're not trying to speak, you know, ill or, or anything, but, um, but I think it's just kind of reframing, reframing things. And sometimes, pe- you know, parents, we do need help. But I think those are are the things that I've learned from self-advocates. Don't like don't talk about me, even if I'm not verbal, don't talk that like like or mm-hmm. or don't, you know, like even if it's good, you know, sometimes kids get embarrassed or, you know, you have to ask their permission. I, I do a lot of presentations and I ask my kids, can I use you as an example? Or can I use mm-hmm. this story as an example? Because sometimes some stories might be embarrassing. So I think there's a lot of um, advocacy on 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 their parts that have been a big learning experience for myself. Thank and you I, have to, I have to agree with Clara because um, volunteering at the clubhouse and other organizations, I am not really taking my own feelings in perspective because I grew up that your feelings don't matter only my mother's feelings mattered. So just shut up and sit down, stop crying. So you're now learning that your feelings matter, but not only do my feelings matter, but their feelings matter. So maybe if you're in the presence of them and you're talking good or bad about them, you have to consider their feelings of how they're going to feel about you, that conversation. And sometimes it is better to remove yourself from the situation to talk in private either with the client or with the client's parents or whoever else that is advocating for them. So I, I do understand what Clara is saying 100%. But I was also wondering, um, are you guys going to do um, Peers to Peers at um, Weston at their peer center? We're looking to collaborate, Tanya. So at this point, wherever... <laughs> wherever um, our peers organizations will allow us an opportunity to engage and uh, do a, a level of collaboration based on shared agendas, we'll be happy to do that as well. If they're, the staff there is open to having Aurelia come in and introduce, you know, as we're doing right now, who PSA is and what we do, because there's a big misconception, right? DRC, Disability Rights California, as an organization, they're like the attorneys, right, that go and represent. There's another unit of investigations who come in and are trying to investigate any type of abuse or neglect. And, you know, we're a whole other team. We're really peer-based, peer unit. We're here to educate communities, providers, and stuff. So there's a big misconception that we represent directly, and we don't. We're not, you know, we do that disclaiming that, no, we don't do that. We're peer self-advocates. We're here to teach you what your rights are and how to navigate various systems. So we always need to separate the two and also work in collaboration with our fellow uh, community partners, right? So, and have them understand that, they, hey, we're here to work along with you. You know, sometimes staff themselves will tell us, hey, we have this unique need how do you foresee that you can help us? It's like, well, there's nothing like educating our fellow peer, right? And helping our peers understand who's who in the room, you know, what the re- responsibilities are of each person, just like in a treatment team. It's like, we're not going to go to the nutritionist about a change of medication, but helping our peer understand who to direct themselves to for each one of their needs. It really levels that level of uh, expectation from staff. And we work with folks to do that so there's so many needs but if they open an opportunity we'll be happy to collaborate Tanya so maybe you can connect Aurelia with with them yes let me talk to Misty and see if we can't get you guys connected because I've been to so many of you guys' things at um Rialto that I I think it's a, I think it's a good thing for you guys to hook up with Pierce and Riverside Sounds great. Thank you for that. Sure, we're we're working. Look, we're looking forward to collaborating with you all in any area you find that we can be of support and you know work alongside with. We would love to have that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dakota. Dakota, Peter, I did you raise your hand? I couldn't tell. Or were you just okay? Um, I what I wanted to share is that when I was institutionalized, uh, in lockup for suicide ideation, I had this real sense of, uh learned helplessness. 
right? That I just sort of, well, they know what they're doing. I, I've never been in this situation before. So I just sort of like gave up. And it seems like so much of the work you're doing is around encouraging people, giving them the um, information, like you said, who's in the room, right? Because I would like, I don't even know who that doctor is. What are they standing in there for? So I, I really admire the work you're doing. My question is about um, if I encounter, say, an unhoused individual who identifies as disabled and would like to get some support in maneuvering through the application for social security then would that be somebody i would connect to to you aurelia when it comes to individual support i i accidentally overlooked that because i wanted to share with you we can connect them to our get help line it's a 1-800 number okay. so they would be able if it's something that we can do at our agency because we don't do that level of a, assisting someone and applying for applications but we can certainly provide the technical assistance like, hey, this is what you would need and, and kind of help people prepare for what they need. Um, if they, you know, at this point, we can't help them directly, but certainly have like what we call a peer to peer call. If somehow we're able to get connected with anyone and help them understand and guide them through that process, we can. We just can't physically sit there and apply for people okay. uh, because there's a level of you know, risk and all this mm -hmm. stuff. But um, yeah, but no, we certainly provide technical assistance, just like we have Ask a Lawyer Day that we can coordinate if people had questions and there's a group of people okay. we can have and, and have lawyers, or if not us ourselves, we've had peer-to-peer -peer calls and people can reach out to us via our Get Help line. It's a 1-800 number. And we would talk to people and help them understand what do you need to have in place to apply for? So certainly. And we also have a housing project line that people can access through our website. So feel oh, free wonderful. to reach out. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I'm just such a fan of the peer to peer model. I was a peer support specialist myself and the county has totally embraced that model. So I think you'll find a lot of welcome. Are there any other questions or? Yes, comments? Rosie, can you put that stuff in the, in the, um, the yeah, phone number okay. and the link in the chat? Sure. Sure, and Dakota, and do you have Aurelia's um, email address? Yes. Yes, yes I do. We're, we've been emailing each other. Okay, so can you send that to Misty for me? Mm hmm Thank you yep. so much. We're going to get this all connected. We're, we're going to do good. Yay. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, so I had a help. question, uh, Rosie. Was, it's on the chat. Would, in how, would IHSS be more of a resource to approach the SS, SSDI needs of an individual? So it depends on who the person is, Peter. There's some uh, restrictions around. I think they were ch looking to change some of the criteria for people to access IHSS um, because in the past it was a person needed to be housed, right? If it was somebody, like in the example that Dakota mentioned, someone should be unhoused, who can they reach out to? But in this case, I would say for an immediate response of support, Dakota, a person can certainly reach out to the Department of uh, Social Services because they have unhoused programs. Like they'll help people connect, whether it's just Medi-Cal, CalFresh, you know, other like, you know, GR, depending on what the needs are and what they may be able to qualify for. The immediate thing is like to establish identity. And I know that the um, Department of Social Services would have more access to helping someone establish that level of identity should they need to get a hold of an ID, a birth certificate, that sort of thing. And then they even waive fees and that sort of thing. So that would be more of a direct support for someone who's unhoused. Um, for the IHSS, I know that in-home supportive services, once a person's um, half a place, even if they're like in a setting where it's like, uh, remember they were doing through COVID, the um, how a key for home key or something like that. One program out here in LA was um, if people were like in these uh, settings, like hotel settings, um, they were able to be uh, supported via IHSS in that, in that regard. So that's something I know of here in LA. I'm not sure in other counties how that's being worked out. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we're ready to move on. Sounds great. Thank um, you for having us here, everyone. Thank you for connecting us, Dakota. Appreciate it. Uh, Rosie and Aurelia. That's... Thank you both for coming. Very educational women right there teaching us a lot of stuff. Thank you, Tony. All right. I want to move on to the next piece of un or to unfinished business. And um, this, the Philippine American Intercultural School, Inland Empire, you'll um, hear us talk about it, P-A-I-S-I-E. 
don't let that the word Philippine throw you. This is for anybody. And I want to um, introduce Nida Castro. Oops, I don't see you on here, Nida. But you're here, right? You yes, want to talk about I this? I am here, waving. Great. Good afternoon. And I'm glad to be here to be able to join you and extend the invite. That's right, Dakota. Uh, it's called Philippine American Intercultural School, but it's for everyone. It's intercultural, uh, intersectional. And we speak about solidarities uh, during this uh, sessions. So our program, uh, the school is is uh, awarded by a grant by the California Endowment, and we get grants from also from the University Health System as well, uh, because uh, Dr. Ernelin is really very much involved in this program, and so is Dakota and Misty has attended this program. Uh, this. Saturday, June 22, our program will be a one-day event at the Civil Rights Institute, and in, uh, it's on Mission Avenue. And below that, Dakota, can you show them or share the link on how they can register? Uh, it's all expenses paid. Yeah, thank you. Um, what That day, uh, we will start with our uh, welcome and proceed also with a presentation uh, regarding mental wellness uh, and uh, staying. Um, can you show the program? I can't, there you go. Uh, and building resiliency skills. Uh, we also have a walking tour of Riverside, uh, which will be led by Rosalind, one of the leaders for the Chinese uh, Committee on Building Chinatown in Riverside. We'll have Tai Chi. Uh, we'll have um, a panel of discussion regarding Stop the Hate uh, because our our school was is funded funded by the TCE. We'll also have introduced culture workshop, which is from the culture, Indonesian culture, Indian culture, and other Pacific Islander uh, for that day. So it I'm extending this invite to you to participate in this uh, building of our community here in Riverside, uh, in San Bernardino, basically in the Inland Empire. Uh, so I hope you guys will join us and maybe Dakota can also share uh, some some of her experience during the school. Uh, but yeah, before thank you do that. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. absolutely. The main thing I learned is something I carry with me, which is the intentional desire to encounter the other. Uh -huh. And, you know, I mentioned earlier about, you know, feeling uncomfortable and putting myself in these spaces that mm, I might not necessarily be used to. Um, because there are spaces that other people have had to struggle with their whole lives and they haven't been in my spaces. So I think it, the onus is on those of us with privilege to step into the other spaces. I like that you said it, it, placemaking and belonging immersion. Um, it's for anybody who wants to learn about American identity as multicultural and diverse. Um, I attended a puppet show um, seminar because we've talked before in this group about how music and dance and theater can some uh, access a part of our brains that just, you know, uh, logic and talk therapy maybe can't access. Um, and that I know there there was an, a Native American speaker told us about the um, atrocities that happened in the mission and why that gets protested because I didn't have any understanding of that. So I recommend this highly to anybody who can attend. It's just one day and you, you're you springing for breakfast and lunch, which yes. is good too. Breakfast, lunch. <laughs> and taking care of the walking tour. So that's all taken care of from the grant. Also, yeah. I think that um, bystander training is really an important first step for a lot of people um, because many of us are afraid to step up uh, if we see uh, marginalization happening because we don't, we feel like we don't know everything. We don't want to make it worse, right? But there are some simple techniques to interrupt the uh, the hate when you see it happening. So I, I'm looking forward to that panel a lot. Thank you. Also, I wanted to, I shared with you the Save the Weekend in September. Did you get that one? Because this one would be in September 13 to 15. Uh, so it's a weekend 
for and it's uh, funded by a grant for the first 50 people who would register. It's at Mountain Springs Resort. Um, and at that time, uh, Dr. Shamilanovich will be leading us and taking us to the uh, Native American, introducing Native American culture. So if you're not that familiar with that, that would be great. We'll also have speakers from our farm workers in the Coachella Valley. So we, under, we would understand what's going on with them, as well as a tour of the Agua Caliente. So in addition to many other things, all we want is for people who register to be with us throughout that period of time. Great. So if somebody yeah. goes to this uh, two weeks from tomorrow and they're just blown away from uh, by it like I was, maybe they'll be interested in the September That's one. Right. And That's we'll right. hit the September one at our at our uh, meeting here. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much for allowing me this time. Thank you for explaining further, Nida. Uh, and so I have two links in the chat, the one that says to register, and the deadline is in two days. Um, the tiny URL is there. And then if you are not sure and you just want to take a look at the brochure, then, uh, you know, the curriculum, I've got that in the chat also. And so just I do want to mention a couple of uh, appearances that we did this week. Uh, the Wade Alliance was represented at the Latino Commission's second annual Walk for Mental Health in Coachella. We were at the Art of Wellness, too, and we came to the Amy MHSA hearings, and I campaigned actively um, and recruited people for Mid-County and the Desert, and I was pleased to see that both of those hearings had a, a good attendance. The Riverside one did not so much. And beyond that, I think we're going to get Krispy Kreme trivia. Um we're still, we're going to announce the winner from earlier. Uh, Tana's going to announce at the end of our meeting. But in the meantime, for a $20 Krispy Kreme gift card, you have a multiple choice question. It's a Juneteenth question. And I don't know if it was answered in the video we watched earlier or not, but let's give it a try. You may answer by typing in the chat or feel free to just uh, open your microphone and 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 say the answer out loud. Here we go. Juneteenth commemorates General Order Number Three. It was on June nineteenth, in eighteen sixty-five. The Union military told enslaved people of their emancipation. In which state did this event take place? Oh my goodness! All right, <laughs> Sarah. Okay, Alabama, Texas, Louisiana, Georgia. And we have a winner already. What's so great about Sarah is you didn't even need to pick one. You just already knew. It was in Galveston, Texas. And congratulations, Sarah. I have your email, so you don't have to do anything. You can, uh, I'll just uh, get that uh, certificate for you. No, don't do this. Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the it, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed like two years earlier. And it took several, two years for uh, enslaved people to learn that they were free. Um, and, and, and the war didn't end just like that. It's like, it went on for a while after it was officially ended. And we don't have that, that doesn't happen with wars now. I don't think, it seems like wars end and everybody celebrates, but uh, congratulations, Sarah, that's awesome. And we can jump into new business and let you know that um, we are going to be at this adaptive sports fair. This is in Rancho Cucamonga, and it's the city. The city is putting it on. It's a week from tomorrow. If you would like to join me for that, uh, shoot me a, a text or an email or a phone call, and uh, you can help me. I'm, you know, we're always looking for volunteers. <laughs> so that's uh, the 15th, which is a week from tomorrow. And since we got to talk about Juneteenth some more, I just love all the intersectionality we're getting here with Native American and um, African American and Asian Pacific Islander American. Um, the Palm Springs, if you're in the Coachella Valley, they're doing Juneteenth King and Queens pageant um, on the 14th, which is one week from today in the evening, three to six. Um, the second annual Juneteenth Awards Gala is a week from tomorrow and the Juneteenth Mixer. So this is our AFWAG group, which is African-American wellness, uh, something families. 
there. Um, I don't expect them to know what WAID stands for, right? But instead of holding their meeting during the day, they're going to hold it on June 19th, on Juneteenth, at, in the evening and make it kind of a mixer. I have these documents on the shared drive. So you can download them there. You can, <clears throat> you can see them there. IEHP. They have a health education department doing community health education classes in the Coachella Valley and in Desert Hot Springs and they're in Mecca. If you have a consumer in these areas, they also do them other parts of Riverside, but I, this is the first I'd heard of them on the east side. I'm going to put in the chat who you need to contact if you have a consumer's clients who could benefit from these classes. And they're, yeah, they're overall general health. So the Desert Hot Springs ones, the first ones were today. It's going on next week and the following week. And then the uh, ones in Mecca, Diabetes and Mindful Living. So Jackie Navarro is your contact. Her name is in the chat. Uh, I was at the Peer Support Research Center earlier this week for the collaborative, the business collaborative. And I just wanted to uh, remind you that Indio has this facility open to any of your consumers they don't have to be on Medi-Cal. They can have private insurance. It's all free. They just do a quick uh, intake and then they can show up for any of these sessions of meditation. They have uh, art classes, recovery games. And by the way, the art classes, they're doing their best to be accessible. They had a low, no vision uh, attendant at one and they just put their brains together and said, you know what? What if we used a glue gun to create a, you know, a, a raised surface where the person can read it and then they can uh, do the coloring on it. So I just love that um, uh, spontaneous, you know, shoot from the hip. I don't like gun metaphors, but <laughs> shooting from the hip, you know, like how can we solve this? Let's get past this barrier. Uh, there are peer support resource centers at Ruston and in Paris also. The video of this meeting will be posted next week, and I'm going to launch this poll. We are meeting July 5th. We're going to skip August, probably. We'll we'll take a, a poll next week, but uh, let me launch this poll. On July 5th, do you want to meet virtually and in person? And uh, there's a second part, which is if we do want to meet in person, which part of the county would you like to meet? So keep the poll open for a few minutes while you answer it. Shall the Wade Alliance meet in person or on Zoom? We haven't had the chance to meet in person. Okay, Claudia, thank you. I'll make a note of that and put it in my calculations. We just, we understand transportation, especially for people with disabilities can be particularly challenging. Um, and I do want to at some point meet in person, but the answers are coming in. And I'll give you about five more seconds. Or... All right. And I'm going to, let's see if I can share the results. We're meeting on Zoom. Okay. That's nice and easy. I like that. Once again, I do want to mention the demographic form. If you can fill it out after we close the meeting, I am putting, we've got the QR code showing on the screen. And there, it's in the chat also, if you want to use that. Yes, we need to know where you are located. And then, ah, okay, we're ready for Tana to announce the winner. We we have one winner, of course, was um, Sarah. She got her Krispy Kreme by, by knowing Juneteenth trivia. And Tana, who do we have our for our second winner is Clara Garcia. Woo! Yay, Clara. Well done. All right. See, it pays to, it pays to. Come to our meetings. Um, I got Clara, I've got your email. It hasn't changed, right? Yeah, so I can do that. And now we can, let me unshare. We did it. Who has book announcements? Who wants the community to know something about your organization? Who would like to share? I actually would like to share something that's not from my organization because I don't have one, but. <laughs> Autism Society. Is, is Clara still here? Yep. Yes. Yeah, I'm here. 
Autism Society has some stuff coming up on their webpage for art classes. Can you share that with us? Uh, yeah, I'll pull that up. We have uh, weekly virtual classes, but we have also some in-person things happening in um, Chino. And, you know, this is this one's for the, the smaller ones. And then we have a movie day in Coachella Valley, which is like five bucks um, a person to, to come in. So uh, if you're out in the Coachella Valley or in this area. We have the Cove Water Park coming up in August. Thank you, Fatana, for, for bringing it up. Cove Water Park in, in August, which is $15 a person, which is a big discount. But we rent out the whole thing for to make it a safe place for our families. So, so thank you. And I'll share our website. Uh, yes, and if you can right share now. the links in the chat, that would be great. Yes, I And will. thank you so much. And congratulations on winning. Thank you. I was free this. this so it was meant to be. <laughs> That's right, it was. <laughs> I love that. Uh, Claudia, your hands up. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> so uh, this coming Saturday, uh, uh, is it okay for me to share the flyer? You go right <clears throat> in. So this coming Saturday, we actually are going to be having our um, Karupa Valley Resource Center. Um, this is something that uh, we literally just started last month. We started off with just a mobile clinic free of charge for anybody in, in the community. Um, but something that we added to it was a diaper distribution. So if you guys know of anybody in the community um, that needs diapers, formula, or even wipes, they're more than um, welcome to come to our, our event on Saturday which is tomorrow from 9 to 1 p.m. I will be there uh, with additional resources of our wonderful organization. Um, and uh, it's like I said, it's going to be in Harupa Valley. Here's the information. But I also uh, on the chat, I put my email address and my direct phone number. Please feel free um, if you need any type of um resource from our organization, I could definitely email you that information. Uh, we provide services for San Bernardino and Riverside County. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share with you guys, um, we're going to be having a huge convention coming up actually next week. It's our NIC conference. It's our National Inoact Inoactive uh, Community Conference. Um, it'll take place June 11th and June 12th. Uh, from um, seven, well, actually it will be like for the community, they have to be there by nine, but um, here's the QR code. Um, if you, part of the community, want to be um, joining us to this awesome event, um, you could definitely um, go ahead and participate. You could email me and I could go ahead and give you the uh, the code. Um, if you're uh, from an organization and you would love to go ahead and be part of the um, the convention too, by all means, reach out to me and I'll go ahead and I'll I'll give you the information for that, the, the code for that. So it'll take place at the Riverside Convention Center. Um, and it's uh, this will be my second um, time going to this wonderful conference. Definitely very motivational, very inspiring. We're going to have about, uh, as far as I remember, about 40 different groups, uh, uh, break, breakout rooms um, with different types of um, information for the community. This is an awesome event. Um, you as a you know community member to to join us and just know and 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 associate with other organizations mingle with people um for those of you who work for different organizations this is a perfect opportunity for you to get to know other organizations and who knows um you could probably start collaborating with other organizations and i love this whole you know convention because it's a wonderful way of how we could connect um, as a community, uh, as an organization, um, connecting with other organizations for the benefit of our beautiful community. So I'm very excited um, about this. And like I said, if you guys um, would like to go to this event or for tomorrow, by all means, reach out to me um, and I'll send you the information. I do have a question. Um, let's say the deaf community wants to join this. I've done assist and 
we did breakout rooms and it was very difficult without an interpreter. So if the deaf community wanted to join this into the breakout rooms, would you guys offer ASL interpreting? I don't know if we're going to be, we are going to be offering interpret interpretation, but I am not sure if we're going to do it in only the main room or is it going to be um, also uh, given each one of the breakout rooms? I'm not sure about that, but I could ask. Yes, that would be interesting to point out so that way we can be included and not excluded. Do you have Tanya's email? Can you let her know? Or, or Tanya, Tanya, do you have Claudia's email? I didn't see if Claudia was able to put it in then. No, I, I can send her mine. Okay. That, that would be awesome. Thank you, Claudia. What uh, I would ask, maybe not the for the tomorrow, it's a little late for that. In fact, email me that and I can send it out later today for the health clinic tomorrow. But um, I put in the chat the link to upload your documents for others to view. Uh, and um, you can put the um, NICC event on there for others. And we can jump to Alyssa. Hello, everyone. My name is Alyssa Nianto. I am the new outreach coordinator with United Cerebral Palsy of the Inland Empire. So I hope to start attending um, these Wade Alliance meetings um, more often. Uh, some things that we have going on is for the month of June, we're actually doing a fundraiser in partnership with Applebee's. So if you go in and order a 10 piece uh, wings, um, half of the proceeds will benefit UCPIE. Um, so that's one great way to support us. We also have our virtual skill builders programs going on Monday through Friday, as always. And then um, I have an event for our August 14th. We will be having uh, an open house here at UCPAE so um, partners can come and join and um, take a look at our office and get to know us a little bit better. Thank you. And Alyssa, UCPEIE does not just limit themselves to cerebral palsy, correct? No, it's not just cerebral palsy. So it's other intellectual um, disab disabilities, um, as well as autism, cerebral palsy, of course, and a few others. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And America. Hello, everyone. Just real quick, I just want just wanted to remind everybody of our free mental health services we have for seniors in Riverside County, anyone over 60 who have some symptoms of um, depression, anxiety, loneliness. Um, we have a therapy program and our post program for problem solving. So you can send them our way. Okay. Thank you. Do we know who you're with, America? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm with Inland Caregiver Resource Center for the programs uh, Pearls and Tribe CBT. Yes, one of our contractors. Yeah, some great. Oh, and you know what? Those documents are also on the um, shared Google Drive. Thank you, America. Thank you. Tana. And as always, I'm always sharing the Take My Hand. They are Monday through Friday. And they're by text only. And if you're deaf, you can get an interpreter to help communicate with them. And they are licensed uh, therapists that can help you out if you're in need or just want to talk. We we talked earlier about the value of the peer um, concept. And Take My Hand is staffed uh, solely by peers. And uh, it's not intended for crisis. If you're in a crisis, they will help you. But mm -hmm. it's really intended for people who are just having some stress and some struggles and need to get some strategies to work out stuff. And you will talk to a peer who will hold you in unconditional high regard, no matter what. All right. How we do it? Okay. Um, I think we can, we can, not I think, we are now adjourning this meeting. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Enjoy your Krispy Kreme, you guys. Hi, Nida. It was so great to see you. Clara, you, you too. Sarah, so you and Lisa, I don't know if we've met before, have we? Uh, but any you guys can go, the meeting's adjourned, but I'm just like chatting up. Lisa, who are you?